In this podcast, we will talk about the budget constraint. You will learn uh, what we mean by consumption basket, budget constraint, budget line, and what is the economic meaning of the slope of the budget line. Let's start by explaining what we mean by budget constraint. The budget constraint is the set of all the consumption baskets that a consumer can afford. Wait, what's a consumption basket? Good point. A consumption basket is a list of quantities of the different goods. Okay, wait a minute. So let me understand this. The consumption basket is a list of quantities of different goods, but the budget constraint is the set of all the baskets that the consumer can afford. Yes. Let's look at an example. Say you have a consumer, let's call her Mary, who must decide on how much coffee and how many eggs to consume. Assume that Mary has $100 to spend on those goods and that the price of the coffee is $10 per pound and the price of eggs is $5 per dozen. Can you give me an example of one consumption basket that belongs to Mary's budget constraint? Okay, let me think about this. I'm not sure. Uh, what about five pounds of coffee and eight dozen eggs? Let's see. First of all, five pounds of coffee and eight dozen eggs is a consumption basket. So we got one example of a consumption basket. Now, to see if this consumption basket belongs to Mary's budget constraint, we need to check if Mary can afford it. To buy five pounds of coffee, she spends fifty dollars, ten dollars times five pounds. And to buy eight dozen eggs, she spends forty dollars, five dollars times eight dozen. So to buy the whole basket, you need ninety dollars. So the basket you picked, it is affordable because ninety dollars is less than Mary's income, that is one hundred, and so the basket belongs to the budget constraint. Well done. Now I'm going to pick a consumption basket and you'll tell me if it belongs to a budget constraint. Okay. What about a basket with 8 pounds of coffee and 5 dozen eggs? Okay, so let me check. If Mary buys this basket, she spends $80 in coffee, that's $10 times 8 pounds, and $25 in eggs, which is $5 times 5 dozen, so the basket costs $105, but Mary's income is only $100, and so that's not affordable. Therefore, your basket doesn't belong to the budget constraint. Excellent. If everything is clear so far, it's easy to understand that Mary's budget constraint can be written in this way. Oh, hold on a second here. Okay, let me explain it step by step. Mary's budget constraint is the set of all consumption baskets such that this inequality is satisfied, where X1 is the amount of coffee that she consumes, and X2 is the amount of eggs that she consumes. I don't really get the inequality. Okay. 10 is the price of one pound of coffee, so that 10 times X1 is the amount of money Mary spends on coffee. 5 is the price of a dozen egg, so that 5 times X2 is the amount of money that Mary spends on eggs. Therefore, 10 times x1 plus 5 times x2 is the total amount of money that Mary spends. And if it is less than 100, it means that the basket costs less than $100 or that the basket is affordable. Okay, this seems easy enough. Uh, does this mean that the budget constraint depends on the prices of the goods and the income? Yes, absolutely. The budget constraint of a consumer depends on the consumer's income, and on the prices of the goods that he faces. So that in general, we can write the budget constraint of any consumer in this way. So far, we learned two basic concepts of consumer theory. What is a consumption basket and what is a budget constraint. A very important concept related to the budget constraint is the one of budget line. The budget line is the set of consumption baskets that the consumer can afford, spending all their income. How do we write the budget line? We can simply write it like this. And Mary's budget line in this way. 
Okay, so the only difference between the budget constraint and the budget line is that now the inequality becomes inequality. That's right. Since the budget line gives us all the baskets in which the consumer spends all the income. Now we can illustrate all these concepts graphically. First, uh, measure the quantity of coffee on the horizontal axis and the quantity of eggs on the vertical axis. Then, consider the basket that Mary can buy if she spends all her income buying coffee. Let's call this basket A. This basket is composed of 10 units of coffee and 0 units of eggs, where 10 is obtained by dividing Mary's income I by the price of 1 unit of coffee. Do the same for this basket, that is, the basket that Mary can buy if she spends all her income buying eggs. Let's call this basket B. The basket B is composed by 0 units of coffee and 20 units of eggs. Again, the number 20 is obtained by dividing Mary's income by the price of 1 unit of eggs. You have now two points corresponding to the, new, to the two baskets A and B, one on the horizontal and one on the vertical axis. If you connect these two points with the line, you obtain the budget line, and the whole region underneath the budget line is the budget constraint. Is it clear? Okay, let me understand. Given a consumer with a certain income, and given the prices of the goods, we can represent the budget constraint as this region, and the budget line as this line. It's like the border of the budget constraint. Very good. An important point to understand is that the budget line illustrates the trade-off that the consumer faces. Go back to the expression for the budget line. We can write the budget line explicitly. That is, we can write x2 as a function of x1. Is this step clear? Uh, I, I guess so. You take the first equation you subtract P1X1 by both left-hand side and right-hand side, then cancel out P1X1 from the left-hand side, you obtain this, and then divide both left-hand side and right-hand side by P2. That's right. So this is just another way to write the budget line as a function. There are two things to notice. First, this function tells you what is the maximum amount of good 2, X2, that the consumer can afford if she's consuming X1 unit of good 1. Let me repeat it. X2 is the maximum amount of good 2 that the consumer can afford if she's consuming X1 unit of good 1. Second, note that this function is linear. With intercept I divided by P2 and slope negative P1 over P2. Let's focus our attention on the slope of the budget line. The slope of the budget line has many economic interpretations. Consider the following question. How many units of X the consumer must give up to obtain an extra unit of coffee? The answer is P1 over P2. Now consider the following question. How many X you can obtain by giving up one unit of coffee? Again, the answer is P1 over P2. Are you confused? Uh, maybe a little bit. Don't be. It is very simple. Go back to Mary's example. Assume that Mary has the following basket, call it C, with 4 units of coffee and 12 units of eggs. The basket C is on the budget line. Now, if Mary decides to get an extra unit of coffee for a total of 5 units of coffee, she can only buy 10 units of eggs from 12. That is, she must give up 2 units of eggs, see the basket D. That is, she must give up P1 over P2 number of eggs, that is the absolute value of the slope of the budget line. Analogously, if she decides to get a unit less of coffee, for a total of 3 units of coffee, she can now get 14 units of eggs from 12. That is, she can obtain 2 more units of eggs. See the basket E. Again, she can obtain 
P1 over P2 number of X that is the absolute value of the slope of the budget line. All of these are consequences of the fact that the budget line is a linear function with slope negative P1 over P2. The economic lesson of this is that the cost of one extra unit of good 1 is given by how many units of good 2 the consumer must give up. Sometimes this might be called the opportunity cost of an extra unit of good 1. In this podcast, we discuss the basic components of a consumer's budget, including the consumption basket, the budget constraint, the budget line, and the economic meaning of the slope of the budget line.